This Rabbi Yaakov Wolby podcast is sponsored by Fabuloso Household Care Rabbi Cleaner. Pastor, Fill I your home with joy. No ads on my podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Tyson's Face Tats. No Have ads. you ever wanted to look like. No sponsorships. Average Rabbi, please. Bill and Anthony's Daily Multivax. Order your six month supply Rabbi with Pastor, promo code TORCH for 10% average off. Average Rabbi. No ads. No sponsorships. No promo codes. But this is how we make money. This is not how we make money. This is not how we make money. I, I will not subject. My podcast listeners, the listeners that I love, the listeners that want to come hear Torah and hear words of wisdom and learn about their heritage and learn about Jewish history and learn about Jewish values and connect themselves with the Almighty and connect themselves with His Torah and deepen their bond with their soul. I'm not going to have readouts. Rabbi Basto, my dear colleague, I'm not going to do it. Rabbi, well, we have bills to pay. Uh, so what's the other option? Is there anything else we could do? We need help. Oh, okay. Well, maybe we, maybe we do something else. You see, most podcasts, they have to pay their bills and they have ads and they have readouts and they have promo codes and they have Dollar Shave Club and Geico and mattresses. I don't want to sell you mattresses. I want to give you what you come for. I want to give you Torah. I want to give you wisdom from the Almighty. I want to give you a connection with our glorious religion and glorious heritage. But we need to pay our bills. So what we do is that we don't do any ads. No ads. No, no matter how much the average rabbi, my colleague, Rabbi Busto, insists on doing the ads, insists on doing these promo codes, none of that. We do an annual fundraiser, and that's happening right now. And the website for that is givetorch.org. Give, the word give, to give. Give your heart. Give your soul. Give a little boost, a little bit of love to Torch. GiveTorch.org. It's happening right now. Every donation is doubled. This is our only annual fundraiser. We do this once a year. Until next year, you're not going to hear about this. It's happening now. If, you, if you're hearing this right now, you should know that it's still active. Every donation is doubled. And yes, Robert Busco, he's insistent. He's insistent. Are you insistent? Well, if there's a better a little solution. Bit. I do like the multivax. <laughs> yeah, okay. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll, maybe we'll make a little exception for that. But no ads. That, that's the plan. We've done now podcasts since 2012, 12 years, and we're committed to this. We're committed to connecting Jews and Judaism locally in Houston and globally throughout our podcast and the many other digital offerings that we have here at Torch. We do one fundraiser a year and we want your support. Visit givetorch.org. Right now, press pause on the podcast. Press pause. Stop the podcast. GiveTorch.org. Make a donation. And then, you know, for the rest of the year, you are partnering with us. We're not going to bombard you with ads. We're not going to bombard you with fundraising emails every day, every week, every month. Once a year, we try to get everyone to give, everyone to contribute. If you appreciate our work, if you enjoy our work, if you want to support our work, if you want to support the great rabbis here at the Torch Center, Rabbi Busto, the average rabbi, and everyone else that's over here, and all the incredible work that we do here from the Torch Center Houston, Texas, visit givetorch.org right now and make a donation. Show us some love. We're not gonna, we're not gonna drive you crazy. Make the donation. Of course, my email address is rabbiwolbajima.com and that website again, givetorch.org. We're up to mitzvah number 138. We're following the mitzvahs in the order in which they appear in the Torah. And we're right now towards the beginning of Leviticus. And we're talking all about mitzvahs that are pertaining to the temple and to the sacrifices that are done in the temple. And the mitzvahs that we're going to cover today, it's 138 through 141. Three of them are about processing specific sacrifices so 138 is processing a sin sacrifice, 140 is processing an asham, a guilt offering, and 141 is processing a shlamim, a peace offering. So this is not the mitzvah to bring these sacrifices, those mitzvahs we already saw. It's once those sacrifices are brought, it's a mitzvah upon the Kohen or the whoever's the, the priest uh, that's working in the temple to process it in the way that is following the protocol set forth in the Torah. And we're also going to briefly mention mitzvah number 139, which is the restriction against eating 
from sin sacrifices whose blood is sprinkled inside. Typically, the sin sacrifice, the blood is sprinkled outside on the outer altar. And those sin sacrifices, at least a portion of them, are consumed by the Kohanim. But the ones that are sprinkled inside, there is a prohibition against the consumption of any part of the sin sacrifices when the blood is sprinkled inside. So we're going to cover these mitzvos, and then at the end, I'm going to share an important idea about sacrifices in general, especially because these mitzvos, they're so far into us. They're so distant from us. We haven't brought a sacrifice in a sanctioned fashion in what, 1900 years? That's a long time. And when you read the Torah, it takes up such a big part of the instruction of Hashem to us. So much is dedicated to the temple, to the tabernacle, to the sacrifices, to the manifold different sacrifices. And we want to study the Almighty's Torah. We want to, we want to understand what He wants of us. You open up the Mishnah, and there are enormous portions of the Mishnah, of the oral law, that deal with things that we've never seen or done. You open up the Talmud, and you can spend years, decades, just studying on a basic rudimentary level the Talmudic portions that are dedicated towards the temple, the temple processes and sacrifices. So is there an idea that could be relevant to us who are so distant from these concepts? That's what we will share, please God, at the very end. Okay, so there's an interesting element of this subject, of these particular mitzvahs, and that is that the mitzvah is not about the obligation whoever is obligated to offer the sacrifice. Rather, the obligation is on the Kohanim to process the sacrifice in accordance with the ordinances and the protocols of that particular sacrifice. And the Sefer Chinuch, which is the book that we are using to navigate through the mitzvos, he spends some time highlighting the fact that this is following the opinion of Rambam. We know that there are 630 mitzvahs. That is clear. Everyone agrees upon that. The Talmud says that. The exact delineation of these 613 is hotly contested. And the Sefer Chinuch, he's going to follow the Rambam. The Rambam has his delineation, the 365 negative mitzvahs, restrictions, prohibitions, transgressions, the 248 positive performative mitzvahs, the Sefer Chinuch is going to follow the Rambam in all of these matters, but he's going to cite the opinion of the Ramban, so Rambam and Ramban, Maimonides and Nachmanides, they have a different calculation. According to Rambam, there are five separate mitzvos, five distinct mitzvos to offer the Ola, the Chatas. So the, what's the, the Ola is the, the elevation offering. The Chatas is the sin offering. The Hashem is the guilt offering. The Shlomim is the peace offering. And of course, the Mincha, which is the meal offering. Five of the 613 are the mitzvahs of the Kohanim to offer it. Whereas Ramban, he says there's only one mitzvah, a general mitzvah, and that is Kohanim must process the sacrifices in the way that is fitting, that is appropriate for that particular respective sacrifice. Now, he's going to side with Rambam, and he uses very... Very beautiful language to explain why. He says, we're following the Rambam. And if you have any questions about it, and you, you, you find the other opinion to be more persuasive, don't attribute the difficulties to Rambam. He's a legend. Even Rambam's contemporaries understood that he was such a legend. If you have any problems, focus your attention on us. And then he says, Rambam, he is the cause of our initiative, the grand initiative of the Sefer Chinuch to write an essay, a chapter on every one of the 613 mitzvahs in the order in which they appear in the Torah, and to give a little flavor, a little snapshot about these mitzvahs, and to offer some rationale, some underlying reason that resonates with us for every mitzvah, and to give a sampling of the laws of the mitzvah. The reason why we did this initiative, says the Sefer Chinuch, is because of the Rambam. And it's only in his merit that we're doing it. 
and therefore we're going to follow him, even though there is perhaps a very good argument to follow the Ramban in this particular subject, namely the number of mitzvos that are of the Sitzertin that are related to the Kohanim's responsibility to follow the protocol of every distinct sacrifice. Now, he's going to spend some time telling us about the, some of the details about all these sacrifices. And again, it's very hard for us to really understand it in a way that resonates. And he's going to, he's going to address that. And he says, like, these mitzvahs are above us. And he says, unlike other mitzvahs where I'm going to offer a rationale, you know, why the mitzvah has a certain, you know, the laws or so, what's the reason behind it? a way to understand it on our level. Here he says, I'm not going to do any of that. When it comes to the details of sacrifices, you know, when they're slaughtered and how they're slaughtered and where they're slaughtered and which place and the various intricacies of how they're offered and how there's the blood is sprinkled and that the time in which they may be eaten and the place in which they may be eaten or when they may, they must be burned. All of those details, and there are again, myriads of details for every particular sacrifice, and there's tons of different sacrifices, all that is beyond us. It's above us. Not not to say, of course, that there's no reason. He doesn't say that these are arbitrary. Of course, nothing is arbitrary in the Torah. Everything is really with the utmost precision and purpose, but it's, for us, unfathomable. And he says, you know, maybe if you have a real standout scholar, someone who's deeply steeped and schooled in matters of Kabbalah, of the esoterica, maybe someone like that can understand the secrets behind the intricacies of the processing of the sacrifices. But we will subsist, says the Sefer Chinuch, with the general notion, the general notion of sacrifices that he, he said it once, but he's constantly revisiting it. What's the general idea? The general idea is, is that humans, we're impressionable up to a point. And when someone wants to repent, you could repent and, and confess and, and say you're going to change. But actions, when someone does something, when someone sees something, when someone visualizes something, that actually creates a more indelible imprint upon them. So when someone takes an animal and brings it to the temple and sacrifices it to God, that reinforces the importance, the imperative to not follow your animalistic tendencies. It does it in a way that greatly exceeds the impact of just staying in your house and repenting and offering verbal confession. And that's the idea, the general idea behind all sacrifices and in all these messages, you can say, I'm not going to offer a reason, you know, why is the shlamim, the peace offering different than the asham, the guilt offering, which is different than the sin offering and all the different types. I'm not going to offer reasons for each one of them. Specifically, we're just going to talk about it in a more general sense and says the Sefer Chinuch, I have discharged my responsibility in explaining the underlying ideas behind these mitzvahs by saying the more general idea, not the more specific idea. I will tell you that I ordered some some books this week that are dedicated towards explaining the deep and intricate secrets behind the actual details of the sacrifices and I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to spend some time going through them just because I find it fascinating that there's so many details and so much nuance in it. And there's a secret behind everything. And there's layers and layers of understanding behind everything as there is with everything in Torah. But he's not gonna do that for us. He's giving us the over, you know, the overview, the, the basic upshot, if you will, of these mitzvos. And he's not going to dwell on that level with respect to sacrifices. Now, in mitzvah number 138, which is the mitzvah of processing sin sacrifices, he offers us a sampling of the laws. 
And he tells us that there are five different animals from which you can bring a sin sacrifice. So there's the sheep and there's the sheep and, and goats and uh, livestock and two types of birds, uh, turtle doves and young pigeons. And some sacrifices are individual sacrifices and some are brought by the public and some are burned entirely and some are are eaten with the exception of their innards which are burned and they are sprinkled only on the outer misbeh, the outer, outer altar. The inner altar is used only for incense during the year but on Yom Kippur there is also some blood services done on the inner altar and then he proceeds to delineate the anatomical parts that are going to be burned. And I found it to be very helpful. I have the art scroll, Sefer Chinuch, and it's got some pictures. As uh, someone who is not very schooled in animal husbandry, it's very helpful for me to, to look at these pictures and look at these diagrams and to look at the the four stomachs, the Abu Mezam. I am probably butchering the pronunciation of that. The Reticulum, <laughs> Reticulum, okay. The Duodenum, Duodenum, and the Rumen. And there's this very nice picture, this cutaway view of the stomach and all the different parts. And what parts are going to be burned on the altar, etc. And he talks about the fat that's on the innards and the fat that's on the abumazum. And that's, of course, one of the four stomachs. And he talks about the kidneys with the fat and the fat of the flanks. And the, the um, again, I'm probably butchering the pronunciation of all of these, the caudate, maybe? Caudate, which is a lobe of the liver. And it goes through which parts are going to be offered on the on the altar, which ones are burned, and the goats, and then the 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 tail and the vertebrae of the spine and the kidneys, etc., etc. Goes through the details or or some of the details of the processing of a sin sacrifice. Now, between the various sacrifices that he's going to talk about, the the mitzvah of processing them. We have mitzvah number 139, which is the prohibition against consuming from the inner sin offering. The Kohanim cannot eat from any of the meat of sacrifices that are done inside, namely in the inner altar. They're not eaten, instead they are burned. And again, he does not offer a reason for this. That's mitzvah number 139. Mitzvah number 140, that is the processing of the guilt offering. So this, that's the asham. And again, he does not offer any insight into the deeper ideas behind this mitzvah. And again, for us, the whole, the whole subject is, is quite foreign. But the chinuch, the sefer chinuch does stress that there's many different types of guilt offerings and they're all identical in their processes with the exception of the asham mitzora. You know, he just says that. But in the art scroll, on the footnotes, they're very helpful. They give you a lot of, it's almost like, it almost serves as like a commentary. This is what it says, just to get a, I think it's important for us to at least mention some of the subjects that are uh, present over here. So the footnote reads like this. All Asham offerings were slaughtered in the northern part of the courtyard. The blood from the slaughter was received in a vessel and thrown against two diagonally opposite corners of the altar so that it touched all four of its sides. So if you have a box and you want to do two applications, you do it on diagonally opposite corners and it touches all four walls. Now the blood that remained in the vessel was poured upon the southern base of the altar and afterwards the emurim, which is the innards, were separated from the animals, and they're salted, and placed upon the altar for for burning. And the rest of the offering was eaten by the male Kohanim in the courtyard during the day of slaughter and the following night. And then it tells us the difference between the Asham, the typical Asham, and the Asham Mitzorah, the Asham brought by a Mitzorah. 
again, I'm quoting from the footnote here, in contrast to other Ashamos whose blood was received by just one Kohen with a utensil, the blood of the Mitzorah's Asham was received by two Kohanim, one using a utensil and the other, and the other using his hand. Okay. The blood received in the utensil was thrown on the walls of the altar, uh, as with all Ashamos, while the blood in the Kohen's hand was applied with a finger to the Mitzorah's right ear, right thumb, and right big toe. Again, this, you read this, and it, we don't know. There's so many secrets here, and it's so mysterious to us. And finally, this Mitzvah number 141, which is the processing of a shlamim. A shlamim, a shlamim is a sacrifice that everyone gets a part of. Uh, they speculate that the reason why it's called shlamim, from the word shalom, which means peace, is that everyone gets a part. The altar gets a part, and the Kohen gets a part, and the person who brings it gets some of the animal to eat with their family. That is the shlamim. And for a third time, he does not offer a deeper reason behind this mitzvah, but once again goes through some of the, the laws. A shlamim can be brought from, from sheep, from goats, and from livestock, from males and from females, from large animals, so aged animals, and young animals, but no birds. And what's the definition of a young animal? That's from eight days old until one year. So certain shlamim, peace offerings, are brought from young animals, which is the time between eight days, first eight days, it cannot be brought as a sacrifice, as the verse tells us. But once eight days have passed up to a year, if there is a leap year, like this year, so it's five, seven, eight, four, when we're speaking in the Jewish calendar, this year it's a double Adar. We have two Adars, Adar 1, Adar 2. There are actually 12 months in this current calendar year. So what happens if there's an animal and there happens to be a leap year in its first year of, of, of life? Is it 12 months or is it a year? And the answer is that when there's a leap year, it extends the eligibility of a young animal up to the the day, so to speak, of his birth, even though that may be 13 months later. An old animal, it's from year one until year three with livestock and with sheep from year one until year two, until it's finished two years. And afterwards, it is considered an old animal and it cannot be brought as a sacrifice. And then he's going to run through some of the different types of shlamim sacrifices. Uh, there are four types of shlamim sacrifices, one brought by the public, three brought by individuals, and he goes through some of the differences and some of the instances where someone would bring an individual sacrifice. Uh, there's the um, certain types of shlamim sacrifices are brought without any bread, without any accompanying uh, bread, uh, m- namely meal offerings. That's the shalmi chadiga brought on on festivals, Shalmi Simcha, and then you have the ones brought as a form of a vow. And then you have the third type, which is brought by the Nazir on the day that he finishes his Nazir tenure. And he, again, surveys some of the laws. What portions are given to the Kohanim? There's the breast and the right thigh, which goes to the Kohen, but with the ram of the Nazir, it's also the right foreleg. And how much bread, and what type of bread, which one's a chametz, which one's a not chametz, which what's the division of the different types of bread, how they're leavened, all the calculations of the different types of bread. Again, he's going to briefly survey some of the many, many laws that relate to mitzvah number 141. That's the processing of a shlamim sacrifice. Okay. What about us? Yeah, we're reading this. We're learning this. And it seems so foreign. Even the notion of a temple, the notion of a place in our world where the Almighty and the Almighty's presence is felt. That's a a novel idea for us. It's a foreign idea. We can't imagine a place in our world that would be hospitable for God. 
But that's what the tabernacle was. That's what the temple was. And we believe that Messiah comes, well, we'll have the third temple. And there will be a corner, there'll be a place in the world that can serve as a domicile for God, so to speak. As a residence where he can dwell. That notion is strange for us. It's hard for us to, to, to be at ease with it. And certainly the notion of animal sacrifices and the, all the different types of sacrifices and so much literature about it. What's a perspective to make our study of this subject more salient, more germane? What's a way to think about it? So I want to suggest a way to think about this. The great Chafetz Chaim, he was the greatest Jew of the beginning of the 20th century. He wrote many foundational books on all sorts of subjects. He's called Chafetz Chaim because his first book was about the laws of Lashon Hara. And it's a citation from Psalms chapter 34, where King David says, Who is the man who is Chafetz Chaim, who is desirous of life? You want life? What do you do? Guard your tongue from speaking evil. And your lips from deceit. First thing he advises, you want life? Don't speak evil. And the Chavetz Chaim, as he became known by the name of his book, he, his name was, was Rabbi Yisrael Meir Kagan. Kagan is a form of Kohen. He was a Kohen, as we shall see. He's going to spend some time talking about the Kohen. But he wrote many, 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 many books. He's known as the Chavetz Chaim. One of his books is a short work. It's called Tzipisa Li Yeshua, which means, did you anticipate redemption, salvation? And it's a citation from the Talmud. The Talmud says in the book of Shabbos on page 31a, that when a person is inspected by the heavenly tribunal, they will ask him six questions. And one of the questions is, Tzipisa li Yeshua, did you anticipate, did you yearn, did you await for salvation? Did you await for Messiah? And the whole book is about this idea of the importance and the perspective of awaiting redemption, awaiting Messiah. And chapter or paragraph of the chapter, it's really section number three, it's all about what can we do? And when you read the book, you know, he, he takes kind of like a, let's, it's like a surprising curveball that he throws at you. He starts off by saying, you know, we always talk about the importance of awaiting Messiah and it's part of our prayers. And he mentions specifically the Aleinu prayer that we say three times a day, four times on Shabbos and festivals, and more times even on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. We talk about how we yearn, we hope, we await to see very, very swiftly the return of God's kingdom. We say, at least we profess, that we're interested in redemption. Are we really interested? Are we genuine in our claim of anticipating Messiah? Are our actions compatible with that, with that claim? It's important for us to await Messiah. There's an obligation to yearn for Messiah. Yearning for Messiah hastens his arrival, but you have to be serious about it. And what does it mean to be serious? It means to be ready. And a major part of the Messiah is the building of the temple and the reinstitution of sacrificial law. And if someone is really anticipating, it's serious, it's genuine, it's sincere, you have to actually prepare. And you have to know what that, what that's like. You have to familiarize yourself with these laws. You have to gain a, at least a basic understanding of what life will be with a temple. And he gives an example. Suppose there's a king who's coming to visit a certain town. Well, they made sure that every road in the town is festooned with banners and flags. 
even if it's not part of the itinerary. Because the king may be coming. You got to be ready. Well, if the king of all kings is coming, we have to be ready. In the times of Messiah, all these laws that seem so foreign to us are not foreign anymore, are not theoretical, abstract, historical, scholarly analyses. They are very practical. And if there is a so-called Torah scholar who doesn't know these laws, it's going to be very embarrassing. It's going to be a disgrace. And specifically, says the, says the Chavetz Chaim, how could someone say in the prayer, Al Cain, therefore, Nekave, we await. We await for your return. We await for Messiah. We want it. And not actually be preparing. You're invoking the name of God, says the, says the Chavetz Chaim. Three times a day. Every week, more than 48 times. Thousands of times a year. And you're saying something which your actions are not compatible with. So you're invoking, you're uttering the name of God in vain. How can you say before God, using God's name, that you are anticipating, you are awaiting, you are yearning that the holiness of God, the honor of God will be revealed in the world if you're not actually doing it. And then he says, okay, maybe we could judge favorably. The masses, let's judge the masses favorably. Because they'll say, listen, I'm not a Kohen. I'm an ordinary guy. I don't do any work in the temple. I'm a lay person. The Kohanim, they're the ones who are responsible. Okay, so maybe we could not attribute blame to the masses. But at a minimum, the Kohanim, they certainly should become well-versed in these laws. After all, God selected them. And every day, every single day, there is the potential that Messiah is coming. And he cites the Talmud. Talmud says, if a person says, I am rendering myself a Nazir on the day that the temple is rebuilt, on the day that Messiah comes, Every single day you can't drink wine because maybe Messiah will come today. So, halakhically, we have an understanding that Messiah can come any day. If you're a Kohen, that means that any day you could be called up to reserve duty to work in the temple. And he cites an historical example. After the second redemption, when the Jews came back from Babylonia to build the second temple, the verse tells us, that the Kohan and the priests, they were the source that everyone went to for their questions about how to live now in a regime of the temple. And certainly, when Messiah comes and the third temple is rebuilt, this will be true as well. And how much disgrace and shame will the Kohanim have when they won't know what to say? They'll have no idea. They never learned it. And then he says, certainly the Kohanim, they must gain a foothold in understanding this. But it's not just the Kohanim. Every Torah scholar must dedicate some time to learn the laws that are pertinent to the temple and to sacrifices. And there's the calculation, Talmud says, that out of every thousand that enter the academy, maybe a hundred can graduate to study the Talmud. And of that, there's very, very few scholars that really emerge. So out of every hundred people, 99% of them are going to be lay people. They're lay people. They're not scholars. But that one person they should certainly have a grounding, a foothold in these laws. That's what he tells us. In the times of the temple, the Kohanim, the priests, they would learn. 
and they would go to the scholars. The scholars may not have been priests themselves, but they were experts, and they would learn how to do shechita, slaughtering, how to do kabbalah, how to do all the processes that the Kohen must do in the temple. And certainly in times of Messiah, well, any time a person traverses an ocean, they have to bring a sacrifice. Anytime a sick, uh, which is the Thanksgiving sacrifice, anytime a sick person is healed, which happens all the time, they have to bring a sacrifice. Anytime someone by mistake violates the Shabbos, the Shabbos, they have to bring a sacrifice. So life's going to change. Someone by mistake violates the Shabbos. They run to the Kohen. I must bring your sacrifice. Do help me. And the Kohen's like, well, what do I know about this? I'll run to the scholar. Says the Chafetz Chaim, how much bizayon, shame, and disgrace, and ignominy will arrive at the foot of these purported Torah scholars that won't know how to respond. And what's going to be? You'll say, okay, when Messiah comes, then we'll begin our intensive study. And it'll take us a few weeks to, you know, brush up on our skills. A few weeks, a few months. Says the Chavetz Chaim. Again, Chavetz Chaim passed away 90 years ago. 1933. And he says, look, look at, look at the world. In our time, almost all the indicators that our sages have told us that are harbingers of Messiah, that are portents of Messiah, almost all of them are present. If you read the literature and you compare it to what you see around you, it seems like the world is readying itself for Messiah. Again, this is written 90 years ago. And the Chavetz Chaim is saying Messiah seems to be imminent because, after all, all the variables and all the factors that are described in the Talmud, they are all present. Now today, that statement is way more true than it was then. But the Chavetz Chaim is saying in his time he already sensed that Messiah is imminent, all the more so today. And therefore, every person should Try to prepare. And it's imperative to not say, we'll have a few weeks off to brush up at the laws. No, we can't delay it a second. And then he cites the Talmud. The Talmud says that the great scholar asked Elijah, well, where's Messiah? He says, well, he's in the outskirts of Rome and you'll find him. He's the one who is wrapping and unwrapping his bandages one at a time. And the reason why he's doing it one at a time, it's because in case he gets summoned to go save the Jewish people, he won't delay. And we, of course, when we did in our Torah 101 series, we spoke about Messiah. We did 16 episodes. We mentioned this Talmud a bunch of times. If Messiah doesn't want to delay even a second, won't even wait a few minutes to finish up his bandages, it's imperative to not delay this at all. And certainly us, we have to do our part, and that's to have a complete grasp of all the laws, or at least some of our sages should have a complete grasp grasp of all the laws, so there should not be any delays. And then he cites an example from the Talmud. The Talmud talks about the decision to eliminate a mitzvah. They eliminated a mitzvah, because that mitzvah would require us to inflict a blemish on animals. And what's going to be, says the Talmud, when Messiah comes and we need animals for sacrifices. And therefore, it's important for us to eliminate this mitzvah. So we see that the sages, they eliminated a mitzvah from the Torah. Because it could result in a delay in the implementation of the messianic features. And certainly us. We have to make sure that we can't, we can't subsist and say, well, Messiah will come and then, you know, we'll do our sacrifices 101. 
And therefore, every day when we say Aleinu, the Aleinu prayer that he started off with, what should we th- be thinking about? We're hoping for the kingdom of God to be restored. What you should be thinking about, says the Chavetz Chaim, is how do I get the Kohanim to become experts, to become Kanyashenti, and all these matters. And if you have that thought and you implement that, that's an indication that you're actually anticipating Messiah. And then he adds, this is not only for the Kohanim, and it's not even only for the, for the scholars. There are many services in the temple that can be done by a non kohen So even the Israelites should get involved. And then he ends off with a few citations about how important and how great and how holy and how powerful the study of these laws are. He cites the Talmud, for example, in the book of Medill on page 31. I believe it's 31a, towards the bottom. Abraham and God are having a conversation. This is in chapter 15 of Genesis. Abraham is worried what's going to be with his future descendants. The verse says, Mama Eda, how do I know that I will inherit the land? So the Talmud is, the Talmud is explaining what the actual back and forth was. What will be? Abraham was concerned. He was worried. What will be if my descendants are sinners? Now we know what happens to sinners. Look at the generation of the flood or the generation of the Tower of Babel and the dispersal. So what's going to be with my descendants? So what did God respond? Take an animal, and that's the covenant of the of the parts. That response, God, the Talmud explains, God was saying to Abraham, well, they have sacrifices, and sacrifices will cleanse them of their transgressions. But Abraham persisted. That's great when the temple is extant. What will be in times that the temple is not extant? How do we benefit from the expiation properties of the sacrifices to cleanse the record, to clean us from any spiritual blemishes? How do we do that when we don't have a temple? So God responded, with sacrifices, not the implementation of sacrifices, but the study of sacrifices. If you study it, not just to read it on a superficial level, but you study it, that has the same power as the actual bringing of a sacrifice. And God, says the Midrash, says the the Talmud, God will forgive us from all our sins. What saves us from devastation and destruction when we don't have a temple and cannot bring sacrifices? Well, the study of sacrificial law. Continues the Chavetz Chaim, he cites another Midrash. The Midrash says that people should not say, well, in the past we would bring sacrifices. And today we cannot bring sacrifices, and therefore we're we're doomed. We just says no. If you study it, you deepen your studying in these laws. It's like you brought it, and that will bestow upon you the same benefits as actually bringing the sacrifice. And he cites yet a, a third midrash that tells us that God told the Jewish people. I know that the temple will be destroyed and the sacrifices will cease. But don't forget the loss. Be careful to read them and to review them and to study them. And if you do, I will treat it as if you brought a sacrifice as well. And the Chavis Chaim says, I know what you're going to respond. Yeah, I know you'll say, well, we're so busy and there's so many other things we need to do. We need, we need to actually learn the laws that are pertinent to us. That's a good rebuttal. Well, yes, it's important to learn the laws that are pertinent in the times of Messiah. But what about, what about us today? We have to make sure that we don't neglect the laws that are pertinent to us. So the Chavetz Chaim, he responds, kind of has like a, a masterful response. He says, well, people study the, study the books of Sanhedrin and Makros and Yavamos, and most of the things that they study in those particular books are not pertinent today. So the laws of touch and the laws of sacrifices, they should be no different. 
And then he says, in the times of the Talmud, they lived in Babylon in the, what, third, fourth, fifth centuries. They didn't have a temple. Yet, they dedicated tremendous efforts to study the laws of sacrifices. And he proves that point. And therefore, for this reason, it's imperative for us to study these laws. And he cites the Rambam. And then he cites another incredible citation from the Zohar, where the Zohar says, if a person in the, in the shul, in the synagogue, in the academy, in the base medrash, if they study the laws of sacrifices and how they are brought, and they have the proper intention, meaning they study it deeply, there is a promise that the angels in heaven that are tasked with being incriminating, the prosecuting angels will have no power over them. And the Talmud and the Zohar continues, this is a secret that was revealed by Elijah. If you want to thwart your heavenly detractors, the angels that are created by every sin, every sin creates an angel. And those angels, they come and they indict a person. But if a person studies the laws of kachin, the laws of sacrifices, they have no power over them. Says the Chavetz Chaim, this should be enough to encourage everyone to try to study these laws. We all have sins, of course, and thus we all have heavenly detractors. And what will we not give up to silence those heavenly detractors? And today, there's nothing that stops that can stop us. In times of the temple, if you were David, king of Israel, Solomon, king of Israel, you're, you're the king. You can't walk into the holy of holies. You can't walk into the holy parts of the of the temple. You cannot bring sacrifices. Some stuff you could do, but most things you cannot do. But today, there's nothing that's stopping anyone. Even the ordinary Israelite can study these laws. And when they do that, the Imari considers it as if they brought that sacrifice. And then he says, okay, there's a lot more. And I wrote another book about this, but that's how he ends this work, Tzipisa Li Yeshua. Did you anticipate? Did you await? Did you yearn for redemption, for salvation, for Messiah? I think this is a very valuable perspective for us. We read about this and it's, it's hard for us to see the value, the pertinence, the salience of these laws. It seems so theoretical. I think a way for us to think about this going forward is in this context. Yes, today we don't have a temple. We have not had a temple for literally thousands of years, right? Not quite because it's like 1950, but it's, Literally centuries and almost 2,000 years. And we may think, well, okay, th- these are not pertinent. They're not pertinent until they very, 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 very much are. And the study of these laws, that's the implementation of a person's sincere desire to witness the kingdom of God being restored to the world, to witness the Messiah, to witness the temple being rebuilt. So yes, when you think about these laws and the shlamim and the sin offering and the asham and the guilt offering and the mincha and the ola, it kind of, it's, it's kind of like swirls in our brain in a way that doesn't really click. Because again, it is very foreign to us. Chafzheim is telling us that this is the way to say that we're genuine in our sincere desire to witness this transformation and this revelation of God in the world. So I think that's a, a good perspective you know, for all the things that we've covered hitherto with respect to the laws, the mitzvos that are related to the temple and the, the, uh, the temple, uh, processes and protocols and going forward as well. We hope to witness that day it can happen this week. Is there anything that prevents it from happening this week? Nothing. And we're supposed to believe it's one of the six questions that we get asked. Did you await Messiah? 
And we say it every day. We want to make sure that we, when we say it every day, we are sincere and genuine. So this is, uh, I think, a perspective that helped, it helped me to understand how, how these laws fit into our lives. We have mitzvah number 138 through 141. The mitzvah of processing, not bringing, but processing the co- the Kohen, processing a sin sacrifice, an Asham sacrifice, and a Shlom sacrifice. We also had mitzvah number 139, which was the restriction against eating from the sin sacrifices whose blood was sprinkled inside. We still have lots of mitzvahs left in Leviticus. We're up to 141 now out of 613. May we all merit to witness the temple being rebuilt, sacrifice being re- restored. And who knows, maybe we will have the great privilege of being alive and witnessing that, seeing the kingdom of God being restored in the world. May we all be fortunate to witness that day. May it happen speedily in our times. Of course, my email address is rabbiwolby at gmail.com. I look forward to your questions, your comments, and your feedback.